We thank you for this morning. We pray that you will bless us, help us to hear your voice and do just as we've just asked you in that song, but build our faith, Lord. We need you. In Jesus' name, amen? Amen. I'm really uh, hollow and echoey and all that kind of good yeah. stuff, so I don't know. You know what I think it is? I think, I think, something's coming behind me or something. Hold on a second. Step on it, step on it. Hey, hey, that's it. All right, cool, cool, cool. <laughs> awesome. So, um, before we get started this morning and jump into God's Word, I want to, uh, I don't know what that is. Oh, that, okay. Um, you never know what this sounds like. So you just never know what's coming out of that thing. So, it's just been an interesting morning, and, uh, you know, the enemy doesn't want God's church to build, and uh, but Jesus gives us some fresh encouragement, and he says that the gates of hell will not stop his church from built, from being built. Amen. So uh, we persevere, and uh, this morning is is no no small test. You know, it's just the same stuff over. In, the devil doesn't have any new tricks. It's all all the same old stuff. Just being a pest. And uh, so Michael and Haley, of course, they they uh, earlier in the week they text out and said, hey, uh, uh, Nick, uh, you want, whoa, whoa, whoa. Dude. hey, turn me down, turn me down, turn me down, turn me down, I'll yell, I don't know what happened there, so, um, so they text earlier in the week, and they said, hey, uh, Nick, you want the, the weekend off, Haley wants to serve this weekend on the soundboard and stuff, so he's like, yeah, that'd be great, that'd be great, so last night, uh, their little girl got a temperature, and they don't want to bring the little girl to church, you know, so, so they couldn't come. So then Nick's like going to be back there all by himself. And then in the middle of the night, his fiance, who was pregnant, Clayton, she starts getting massive pains in her stomach. And she ends up, she's, she's fine. Baby's fine. But so he's been in the emergency room all night long with her. Uh, so that's awesome. And then I got here this morning and the computer that puts all the fancy, nice, pretty cool stuff up on the wall up here that you guys are used to, you know? Yeah, that thing quit working. That was awesome. And then the uh, the giving computer up front, you know, because we have so much money in this church, we don't need you to give. And so, right, so, so the, computer, the the little reader, you know, that you're supposed to put your card in, that doesn't work anymore either. So just don't, it's awesome, right? But I uh, I text my wife this morning when all this was going down. I'm like, you know, we have the coolest church. We don't have a band. We don't have a youth group. We don't have any people. We have no money. We have no graphics, but we got Jesus. Yeah. <laughs> You know, we rejoice in that. Uh, so, but I want to—I want to take a second. I want—I want to uh, pray for for uh, for Michael and Haley and and, uh, and Elena. She's got temperature. I don't know what's going on over there. She's probably just fine. You know, everyone's free. You know, if you, you get a sniffle now, Corona, right? Everyone, everyone's dying. Everyone's dying, right? So, uh, but that's not the case. You see it on TV now too. You know, our president got Corona. So, uh, what's what are we gonna do? He's gonna die. So. Who's next? Pelosi's going to be in charge and this and that. Like, they're, already, they're writing the dude off, right? He's got a sniffle, right? He's dead. Let's just, he's just bury the guy now, right? Because he's got corona. It's just not good. I think we got some people in this room, right? Cast, like, you talk about how, how dead you are. Look how dead this guy is who had corona. It's, it's an amazing dead guy, right? Here's a dead lady over here. There's another dead lady over here. Dead as a doornail, right? Oh. Crazy, crazy. But let's let's pray for, for them, and uh, we'll pray for Claylin and Baby and all that kind of good stuff. So, Father, we thank you for uh, lending an ear to listen. We're thankful that when we pray that you hear us, that you care, and so that you respond to these things. We pray in your will. We pray for things that please you. You are quick to respond to that. And so even though prayer is mysterious, Lord, we know that there's some power there. And so we're asking you, Lord, to, to bring blessing and favor and healing upon little Elena and uh, just bring her back so that from, from this cold or whatever she's got and uh, reduce her temperature and make her feel better. Amen. And we thank you for that. Uh, we want to pray for uh, Claylin, Lord, and we're thankful, Lord, that baby's fine and that she's fine. And, and uh, so we're grateful for that. So we just ask for your continued blessing on the progress of that beautiful little child that you have inside of her. Look forward to meeting that child. Um, Lord, we're thankful for um, our president. We pray for him. We pray for a speedy recovery, a speedy and full recovery to our president. Whether we like him or not, we pray for him because you love him and you care for him. And he's in office and he's there to, uh, to protect those that uh, do evil and uh, to protect those who do good and to um, punish those who do evil. That's the role of our government, Lord. And so um, you put him there for that purpose. And so we pray that you would uh, bless him and bring healing to his body quickly, him and his wife as as well. 
Lord, we thank you for this time here together, and uh, thank you for being a good God. Thank you for being a good Father. Thank you, Lord, that we don't need fancy graphics on the wall to experience your presence and your power. So we thank you for that, and uh, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen? Amen. All right, so um, <clears throat> one of these days, I get, we got to do something. It's like super blowing my ears out up here, so just do, do something to help me. Um, it, it might get ugly before it gets better, so if we go through, just don't be surprised, okay? Um, been there, done that. Um, so I, I started preaching through the book of Acts uh, a long time ago, and I believe at some point we're probably going to get back there. And every time I think that we're going to get back there, um, there's just something that comes up, and I, I just want to trust in God's leadership in that. The Bible says to follow the Holy Spirit in everything that you do. And so I'm just trying to feel the promptings of his spirit and just go with that, okay? And so um, I know we pre we're preaching through the book of Acts. I want to get back there. Um, it's super, super important. Jesus taught some things, and, and his early disciples taught some things, and we see it all in the book of Acts. And so we want to see some truth shared so we can understand as believers what we're supposed to believe, right? And then we also are looking for examples shown so not only what we believe, but how we should respond to Jesus, right? He said some things. He said he taught some things. He did some things. He showed some things. And then he said to do some things. And we want to see the in the book of Acts, we see how they properly responded to Jesus so that we would know how we're supposed to respond to Jesus. Amen? Amen. So that's what, we're, that's what we're supposed to be doing. But of course... I go into my Bible to this week, and I'm like, all right, that's where we're going, and that's just not where you're going. So why don't you do me a favor and open up your Bibles to 1 Peter. Open up your Bibles, right? Grab a Bible, grab a Bible. Don't just listen to me. Grab a Bible. And let's open up our Bibles to 1 Peter. Um, as you're turning there, I want to say that one of the there's lots of promises that God gives his people. And I think that one of the, 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 the most comforting truths, one of the most comforting promises that God gives, has given to the follower of Christ is found in Christ's commission at the end of Matthew chapter 28. You don't have to turn there, but this is just what it says. This is some of it. It says, I will be with you always. I will be with you always. That's an incredible promise. Okay? Now, now that if you think, if you stop and ponder that for a little while, that can be a little bit scary. Right? Because, you know, like, how, how many times when you were growing up that, that, that you were doing something naughty, but if your dad was standing there watching, you probably wouldn't have done it. <laughs> Say amen. Right? <laughs> so so there, there, it can be a little bit scary to know that God is with you always. And it could probably, and I think this is good, it can help build a healthy fear of the Lord in you, knowing that he's with you all the time. Right? Where can I go to escape you, says the psalmist. Right? Nowhere. I can't go anywhere to escape you. He's omnipresent. He's everywhere. The eyes of the Lord go back and forth. They're wa He's watching everything, right? So it can build a little bit of the fear of the Lord in you. And I don't think that the fear of the Lord is something that's preached in churches enough. The Bible is just pregnant with, with verses about the fear of the Lord. Let me just give you a couple of them. You can jot the references down if you want. But I'm going to go through it pretty quickly. How about this? Deuteronomy 6.24. Fear the Lord for our good and survival. Psalm 31, 19. How great is your goodness which you have stored up for those that, have, that fear you. Psalm 112, 1. How blessed is the man who fears the Lord. Proverbs 10, 27. The fear of the Lord prolongs life. Psalm 33, 18. The eyes of the Lord is on those who fear him. Psalm 34, 7, the angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear the Lord. Right? And how about this one? You remember that, that verse that we talked about at great length during our Unhero series of uh, if God's ways and his thoughts are not like ours? And just as the heavens are above the earth, so are his ways and thoughts above and different than ours. Remember that verse? How, how, big is, how, how big is that space between heaven and earth that God's just... That, I mean, you know your thoughts, right? You know your thoughts, and, and you know that there's this massive gap, this huge area that, 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 that separates your thoughts and ways from God's ways. You understand that that's huge, right? So how about this one? I thought this was really, really cool, talking about the fear of the Lord. Psalm 103, 11. For as high as the heavens are above the earth. That sounds familiar, right? Think about how big that is. 
For as high as the heavens are above the earth, big, say that's big, so great is his loving kindness towards those who fear him. But the church needs a healthy fear of the Lord, right? And knowing that he's with you all the time should put a healthy dose of the fear of the Lord inside of you, knowing, hey, he's watching everything I do, right? So, but but the, at the same time, knowing that he's with you all the time and that he sees everything that, you, that you're doing and every place you're going and, and he hears everything you're saying, right? We understand that. But at the same time, we also understand that since he sees all those things, he also sees your challenges. He sees, he sees your mountains. He sees your troubles. He sees your problems that you're facing, right? He sees them all the time. So how about this one? This will bless you. Psalm 46.1. God is our refuge and strength, an ever-present, right? He's ever-present, right? What did Jesus say? I'll be with you when? Oh, right? Here, here it is again. I'm ever-present. I'm, and ever-present means always. Every moment, every day, every month, every week, every year, he's with you, right? He never leaves you. I'm ever-present. But not only is he ever-present, watch what it says here in Psalm 46.1. I'm an ever-present help in times of trouble. See, so when we, when, we, when we understand the idea that God is always with you, it carries with it this, this idea, this truth that not only is he with you, but he's w working with you, right? He's not some passive observer of your trials going, oh, yeah, I see what's going on there. Hope they figure it out. That's not what he does, right? He's an ever-present help in trouble. He's an active participant in your life. So he's not just watching, right? Remember this. I've, I've heard the cries of my people in Egypt, right? And so I'm sending you to go fix that thing. He didn't just hear it. He didn't just know it. He heard it, and he has compassion on his people, and it causes him to do something about it. So when you know that he's with you, you understand that it's twofold. He's with you, and he's working with you, right? And so now, here, here, now that's true, right? That's true. Now here's what Jesus would say in John 16, 33. He would say, in this life, you will have, Bible translations, you ready? You will have troubles, sorrows, tribulation, or suffering, or in my translation, it says trials, right? You will have trials. How many people can relate to that? Oh, yeah. Right? Right. Every hand goes up in the house, finally, right? Okay. How many people that have their hand up can, can also agree that not only can, can, will they happen, but they're hard and not exactly fun, kind of tough when you're going through a trial in life, right? Oh, yeah. Everyone still agrees, right? And, and that's why a proper understanding of trials will be a game changer in your life, right? A proper understanding of trials can alter the feelings that you have while you're going through it and severely alter the results that happen after the trial comes to an end, okay? So let's pray right now so that God can help us to have a proper understanding of trials. Lord Jesus, you said that in this life, right here, right now, from the time we're born to the time we take our last breath, that we will have trials. And so, Lord, this morning we come to you and we're asking you through your word, by the power of your Holy Spirit, base it on truth. Change the way we think about trial. Give us a, a proper understanding of the inevitable in our life so that we could deal with it better. So we could have this overwhelming victory that is ours in Christ. We, we, we as Christians will suffer. We will have trials and tribulations. We will get cancer. We will have divorce. We will have bankruptcy. We will have car accidents. We will have every single thing that all the others have. But our victory comes, as Paul described, that even though he was whipped and beaten and shipwrecked and jailed, that overwhelming victory was his in Christ. So there's something there, Lord, that we need to change in the way we think about trials. And, and I know, I'm just like all the other folks here, that we have a, a preconceived notion. We have a, we, it's deeply ingrained into our, into our hard drive uh, as how to view trials. And you said that we should, you want to change the way we think by renewing our mind, right? You want to change us into a new person by renewing our mind. So that's why we're here this morning, Lord. We want to hear from you. We want to change the way we think so that we think the way you think about this inevitable thing called trials. So help us now in Jesus' name. So, so that's why I asked you to turn to 1 Peter, but you know, in the Bible, 
all throughout the Bible in all these tremendous stories, story after story after story, right? There's all kinds of stories of trials and trouble and all that, right? There's all kinds of teaching. We're reminded of, 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 of our buddy Job, right? So if you read the book of Job, right, there's all kinds of lessons in there to be learned about trials. He goes, that guy's going through it, right? Oh, yeah. but, but, but he's not, but, the, but, but he's not like saying, hey, hey, listen, 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 listen. Listen, Diana, when, when you're going through trial, this is what you need to do. Like, if that's not what happens in that book. We, we read the book, and we can glean from the book how he lived his life out so we can learn how we should learn how to live our life out when we go through stuff. Right? That's, that's the way it was with Job, right? It wasn't like intentional teaching about it, it's, but there's teaching in it, right? Yeah. It's the same thing kind of with Jesus, although he did teach some about trials. But if you look at his life, right? We saw he went through some stuff, right? I mean, the guy went through some. He never did anything wrong. The guy was awesome and great and beautiful. Helped everyone, taught, blessed, healed, fed him, right? Just awesome dude. But he went through some stuff that would seem to be unfair. And we can learn from him that when he went through it, what did he do so that we could do the same kind of a thing, right? So again, not, not necessarily a deliberate teaching. Hey, hey, yo, listen up. When this happens, do this. Right? When that happens, do that. That's not the way it was there. Now, when you get to like the book of James, it starts to change a little bit. He starts actually teaching us what to do when we go through all that kind of stuff. But the, the most highly concentrated teaching in all of Scripture on the issue of trials is in 1 Peter. And that's why I asked you to turn there. So this morning, our, our sermon, our message called The Truth About Trials, I, wanna, I jotted down five trials truths. And I want you to jot them down, too, so they can help bless you and change the way you think about trials, right? We want to get victory. Anyone want to have victory over this, right? Yeah. I want a victory, right? So here's some stuff from God's Word that will encourage you. Here's the first one, and it's just Peter agreeing with Jesus. He was taught and taught well. And the first thing is trials will come. Trials will come. If you look at 1 Peter chapter 4, look at, verse, look at chapter 4, verse 4. 12, I believe it is. Look there. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 12. Are you there? Yep. Okay. Dear friends, don't be surprised at the fiery trials you're going through, right? Not just trials. What kind of trials are they? Fiery. They're fiery, right? Fire. Hey, let me burn your hand for a second. What happens when I burn your hand? What happens? It hurts, right? So fire hurts, right? It can be painful, right? But you also understand that pro fire also what? It purifies things. When they want to get rid of an area that's really vulnerable and could burn down and cause a problem, they, they burn it on purpose. But when they burn it on purpose, right, the trees are going, oh, oh, oh. But it, it cures the forest problem, right? It makes it so it's, it's healthier. And all of a sudden, after a little while, you see after that massive fire goes through, that you see green sprouts starting to come back up, right? It makes it healthy. It purifies things. It makes it better. But it's a fiery trial. So it's going to hurt. Dear friends, don't be surprised at the fiery trials you're going through as if something strange were happening to you. This is common, right? Not like, oh, I didn't know that was going to happen, right? No Christian should ever say, man, I thought everything was going to be peachy keen. Listen, that's what heaven's all about. It's not like that here, right? You're going to have trials and problems, right? Don't be surprised as if something strange were happening. Don't, don't come to me and say, Pastor, I can't believe that this happened. Of course, listen, of course it's going to happen, right? That's what it says. Don't, 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 don't think that it's something strange. Everyone's going through it, right? You're not alone. You're not unique in any way in that, right? We're all going through it. Everyone has it. Instead, he says, be very glad these trials make you... Okay, I'm going to read on after that. But don't be surprised, okay? Don't be surprised. See, when I was in the golf business many, many years ago... We'd have these golf tournaments for the professionals, right? They would come city to city, and they would go out there and compete for big money and all that stuff. But what would happen is, uh, before the weekend came with the tournament, their caddies would show up, and, and you'd see them out there on the golf course, and they would walk the golf course. And they'd walk the golf course with a, pad of, a small pad of paper and a pencil, and they would start jotting down where all the bunkers were. You guys know what bunkers are? The sand, you guys probably call sand traps, right? <laughs> Okay. The, where the sand is, that's a problem. Right? You don't want to hit it in there, right? They, they marked down on, on the notes where the, the water hazards were. Like, Because sometimes if you play any golf, right, you can stand up on the tee, and it looks like, oh, there's a runway out there. You land a 747 on it. But when you get out there, there's this little hill. You didn't see it. There's a little water down there, and boom, your, your ball's in the water. 
Sometimes you're gonna, you look at a green and it looks like nice and flat. I can just hit it on there, no problem. But you don't know that there's this false front to it. So if you don't hit it and carry it onto the green, it'll hit a little bit short. Instead of rolling up, it's a big hill like this. What happened? It comes trickling back down the fairway at you and it's at your feet again, right? So the, they, they make notes of these things, right? So they can be better prepared, right? They're better prepared if they know. They want to know that there's going to be trouble coming, right? So you can be better prepared for it. Because in life, the most difficult situations, the worst problems and trials are the ones that surprise you, right? I never saw that one coming. I was going along just great. Everything was rocking at work. My family's good. And bam! And I didn't see it coming. And if you're not prepared for it, it can really knock you for a loop, right? Yeah. That's the worst kind. So that's why God wants to help you right here, right now. And, and give you some advice on trials. And his first bit of advice to you is that they're coming. They're coming, right? Don't be surprised by the fiery trials that you're going through, okay? Here's the second thing. Trials as in plural. As in plural, right? Amen. Look at 1 Peter ch chapter 1. Go back to chapter 1, verse 6. You're going to get a lot out of verse 6. You there? So be truly glad there is wonderful joy ahead, even though you have to endure, what? Many trials. Many trials, right? I don't like to use Christian cliches and little, 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 little phrases and, and stuff like that that everyone's used and beat to death, but so appropriate right here, right? I heard it said, and it's so very true, that you're either coming out of a trial, you're in a trial, or you're heading for one, or I should say it's heading for you. You're always involved in some type of a trial, right? Nobody ever graduates from trials in school, right? No one gets their master's degree in trials and gets to graduate, right? No farmer ever, you can never look back, never talk to a farmer, guaranteed, and they'll say, hey, you know what? Back in 1983, that was just the easiest year. Everything went great. It was just the right amount of sun, right amount of rain. All my help showed up. The crop was perfect. That never happened, right? Every year, very, very difficult. Every year, no player ever had an easy season. Hey, we just we just showed up, everyone knew their plays, everyone executed the plays, Casper, perfectly, and we just went right to the Super Bowl, and we won it easily, and no one even gave us a problem. That's never happened, ever, right? Nobody's ever graduated, right? Many, many trials, right? Don't be surprised, not only that you're gonna have them and it's gonna hurt, it's gonna be hard, but there's gonna be many. And don't be surprised when many of them show up, right? Just like the, 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 the waves of the ocean that never stop, never stopping, always coming. They're going to come no matter what. Don't try to dodge the problem. Don't try to duck the problem. Don't try to pray the problem away. Just learn how to deal with it better. That's what God wants you to do. Because listen, you can't avoid them, right? They're coming. And, and, and your challenge here today and what God wants to do in your life is to teach you to deal with it better rather than trying to pray away. I've, I've said this before in this church. We're trying to rebuke every single thing that comes into our life, right? And all the while God's going, no, stop, stop, stop. I'm trying to teach you something, right? Amen. What would happen to every diamond that never said yes to the crusher? <laughs> it would stay as coal, right? It need, you need to stay under that thing. We're going to talk about that in a moment. Okay, so challenges are going to come, and we need to learn to deal with them better. So not only are they coming, and that there's many, here's the third thing, trials are temporary. Someone say amen. amen. Right? That's good, right? Back to verse 6. There's wonderful joy ahead, even though you have to endure many trials for a little while. For a little while. How many people feel like their trial has been a little bit, like that doesn't really describe it too properly, yeah. right? Okay, just remember how old God is. Yes. That helps, right? Think, we need to think eternally, right? We need to think eternally. Don't think about right here, right now. Think eternally, right? So an exa example this morning, I was kind of really ticked off about the stupid computer, right? But at the end of the day, that doesn't really matter. What I really need to start to reshift my thinking, because I, you know, this is what God does. He takes the preacher to the map before he takes, lets the preacher take them to the map, right? So I'm sitting there and I'm praying. I'm like, God, okay, I know what I said in my notes. I know what I'm going to say to them. So what is it you're trying to teach me? And I realize that he just wants to create some transformation in you, right? That's all that matters. 
Who gives a rip about the computer on the wall, right? That's all that is. We gotta think internally. He wants to change our life. He's not working on our computer, he's working on you, right? And me. He's working on me. Say he's working on me. He's working, he's working on, on me. On trials me. are temporary, right? And our tendency when, when things get tough, we have trials in our life, is, is to give up on Jesus. Like, uh, that was a nice fad. I tried it for a while. It wasn't really working out. I thought things would be a little bit different. I, I imposed these standards upon God that, that I thought up in my mind, and you've got to live up to them. And when you don't live up to them, I try to, I just kind of fade off, right? <laughs> Happens all the time, right? We see it. Jesus, we talk about that about the four soils, right? Jesus talks about the soils. The word of God comes down, and it, and it lands on this hard surface, and the devil comes and swipes away, and it never gets in, and they never believe anything, and they never walk with God, right? But then there's a couple other soils where the seed gets in, and it sprouts new life, right? But then as soon as troubles start, boom, they walk away, and it dies, right? And we don't want to be that person. A lot of people walk away because they, they just get a little concerned, like it's not really what it's supposed to be. This is what I thought it was, but it's really not, and so they walk away from the Lord. So this is what the Lord would say to you today to help you. He's an ever-present help in time of trouble. And if you're in a trial right Amen. now, he's here right now to help you right now in this situation right now. And here it is right now. Verse 13 of chapter 1. So think clearly. I see. you got to think clearly, right? And that's why we're in church again today, right? To reshift our thinking the right way. Because we came in thinking wrong. We're going to walk out of here thinking right about trials. And in our, in our thinking is it hasn't worked out the way I thought it should. And so I've bailed on God, right? But he says, no, listen, think clearly. Stop thinking that way. That's not right. Become a new person by changing the way you think. That's what he said. Because the way you think will alter the way you live, right? So he wants you to think differently about this and exercise self-control. How easy is it to fall back in old patterns, right? It didn't work out for me chasing Jesus. It's not what I thought it would be. So I'm just going to go back to this thing. It wasn't working well, but I was figuring out a way to work it. So at least go back to that. And that's awful thinking, right? Exercise self-control. Like, recognize, hey, I'm, I'm thinking wrong here. I'm going to stop that, right? Because I know it's going to hurt me, right? I've been there. I've done it. It hurt too bad. So I'm going to stop. He says, think clearly and exercise self-control. Look forward so you need to... Watch here. He's changing your eyes. Okay, stop thinking about what you think it should be. Stop thinking what you think God should be. Stop thinking about this trial the way you think it should work out or what, it, what you think it is. And he says, look, look forward to the gracious salvation that will come to you when Jesus Christ is revealed to the world. How much room is there in that statement for looking at your problem? None. None, right? But we do it. And that's why he said, I want you to think clearly. Change the way you think. No one, God will not make you change the way you think. He's given us choice, right? Choose today whom you will serve, right? If, 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 if the Lord is God, then follow him. If Baal is God, then follow him. How long will you go back and forth between two options? Make a choice, right? He told us to make a choice. And since you live by the Spirit, let the Spirit lead you in all that you do. So he says, I want you to make a choice Think clearly, control yourself, don't go back, look forward to the grace of salvation that will come to you when Jesus Christ is revealed to the world. So you must live as God's obedient children. Our tendency is to give up and say, no, I don't want to do this anymore. But he's like, no, you, you what? You must live as God's obedient children. Don't slip back into your old ways of living to satisfy your own desires. You didn't know any better then. Right here, right? Right? Come on now, sinners, right? We didn't know any better. I did some real stupid stuff before I knew Christ. Now I know better. Sometimes I still do it, right? But but at least I, now I know. I know what I should be for. I, I was kind of naive and it's kind of stupid, right? Ignorant. I didn't know, but now I know, right? I've had people tell me some things. I've read the Bible. He's told me some things, and I know what's better now. I've done both. I've lived both, and I can tell you that it's much, much better over here than it is over there, right? And we know this. But sometimes when, when God, quote unquote, see the air quotes, when he fails us, we'll run back to the same old stupid stuff again, thinking somehow it's going to get better this time. Someone say stupid. Stupid. Very stupid, right? Don't slip back into your old ways of living to satisfy your own desires. You didn't know any better then. But now you must be holy in everything you do, just as God who chose you is holy for the scriptures say you must be holy because I am holy right 
So he's like, listen, 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 listen. listen. I know that this, this is not working out the way you thought. I know your tendency is to slip and fall and say, I'm done. I give up. It's not what I thought it was going to be. I'm just going to go back over to this thing right here because my problems are too big and my God is too small. And he's like, no, no, Woo, time out. Put the brakes on. I want you to think clearly. I want you to look for it. Keep your eyes on something different, Rio. Rio, don't, don't look at the big problem, right? There's pain in that thing. There's gain in that thing. But don't, don't spend all your time focusing on the problem and what you think it should be, Colossians 3.1. Set your eyes on the realities of heaven where Christ sits at the right hand of the Father. How do we run the race with endurance, the scriptures say in Hebrews? How do we run the race with endurance that God has set before us? By fixing our eyes on Christ the author and finisher of our faith. Don't set your eyes on the problem. Set your eyes on the creator. That's what we're supposed to do. If your eyes are there all the time, you'll be able to maintain and endure and keep going. Think clearly about this. Don't give up. Don't give in. This stuff's not going to last forever, right? I'm coming back to get you, right? I promised you that. I'm preparing the place for you. You're, listen, listen. Your 80 years here on earth are dwarfed by the enormity of eternity, right? So, so just remember, he's coming back to get you, and it's not going to last forever. There's pain and there's gain in all of your trials, but your eyes need to be fixed, and this morning fixed afresh again on Jesus Christ, the author and finisher of our faith, our prize at the end. If we fix our eyes there, it's going to help you get through today's trial better. When you, when, listen, when, when I was growing up, when I was in elementary school, and I was in gym class, in Mr. Howie's class, he used to have us walk the balance beam. Ever, anyone ever walked the balance beam before? Gymnastics or anything like that? Okay. What's our tendency? To, what, what do we do when we walk the balance? What's your tendency? To fall off. To fall off. Amen. Right. Why do you fall off? Right? It seems logical in our human thinking is to look where you're going, right? You're supposed to look where you're going so you can stay on there, right? That's the worst thing you could do. Exactly. What are you supposed to do? Any gymnastic <laughs> What do you do? You look at the end of the balance beam. You look at the goal. You look at the prize. That's my prize. I want to get there, right? That's how I win. The best way to, to, to maintain proper balance and footing here is not to look here. It's to look there, right? And it's the same thing with trials in life. Don't look at the trial. Look at the solution. Look at Jesus Christ. That's how we get through these things better, okay? You see it. You see it. Look, 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 at, look back in, in 1 Peter, verses 3 and 4. Right? This is, this is, the context is, tri is trials. But look at 3 and 4. Now we live with great expectation. Listen, I'm going through this, right? I'm going through this. And it's kind of beating me down and making me frustrated. And I want to give up and quit, right? I don't, this Jesus thing's just not working out. Now we live with great expectation. Why? We have a priceless inheritance, an inheritance that is kept in heaven for you, pure and undefiled, beyond the reach of change and decay. And through your faith, God is protecting you by his power until you receive this salvation, which is ready to be revealed on the last day for all to see. See, a lot of us have this bad thinking. We think because somebody told us that when you said yes to Jesus, that it's good for you. Right? And it is. But they gave you the wrong good for you. They told you that good for you means it's your best life now. I'm not picking on Joel Osteen, but that's the title of his book. The most popular Christian preacher on the planet. Your best life now, right? That's not your best life now. This is not your best life now, right? When's your best life? In heaven. In heaven is your best life now. Eternity, right? Your life, your, the Bible says your life is but a vapor, right? Here today, gone tomorrow. All of us are experiencing it. We're all getting older. We're all one day closer to the day. Right? And that's gonna and it went by quick. How many people in here that are what 70, 80 years old that feel like life was really slow? <laughs> but fun. But fun. Boom! Right? Just like that, right? Like what happened? Yeah. It goes by fast, right? Because this life is temporary, it's not gonna last, right? It's not gonna last. We gotta start thinking about eternity, right? So, so he, listen, our best life is in the future. Our best, li our best life is in eternity, in heaven, right? And unfortunately, some people are taught that you can, like, even though, like, your kingdom come, your will be done, like, it should be kind of like heaven, okay? But it's not heaven. It's like heaven in that you should be worshiping him here, get that, right? But circumstance, like, 
in heaven it's way different than it is here. So stop having these false illusions that it's going to be just like heaven when you bend the knee to Jesus. Right? Ask Paul how good it was for him. <laughs> I don't know what's going to happen to me, but I am told by the Holy Spirit that in every city I go to is going to be punishment, jail, and whips, and beating. That's what I'm going to get for saying yes to Jesus. Woo! Sign up! <laughs> but to live with great expectations. So here's the deal. When we live with great expectation, what that means is that we should let the future blessings bleed backwards into your present problem. Right? right? right. That, that's what we do. We take the future blessings that are coming and we're living with such an, an excitement and anticipation of that, that that excitement bleeds backwards into your life now. So no matter what happens, that's why we change things around here. Remember what I say. When things are crappy in your life, when I ask you how things are going, what are you going to say? Great. 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 Why? Because I'm saved, right? It, it, it all, everything else pales in comparison to the fact that you are saved and going to glory forever, right? Your problem Amen. now, your car's broke down. Awesome, right? That'll be fixed by Tuesday. How about the next million years in, in a place where there's no sorrow, no pain, no suffering, no nothing, nothing bad, all good. Thank right? You. Right. Thank awesome. you. Awesome. Awesome. Great. Highly blessed. Yes. Truly blessed and highly favored. Exactly. Our future blessings should bleed back into ourself, into our situation now, right? I know I'm sick, right? I might live, I might die, I don't know, but I know I'm going to be with him forever. He might heal me now, he might heal me with my last breath, but I'm going to be with him forever. I get to worship him forever. I get to be with everyone that I love forever, and I'm not going to worry about anything. I know my, my financial situation is bleak and dark and ugly, and, and mine is. Why I get it, right? But I know that he owns the, the cattle on a thousand hills. And, and out of his glorious unlimited resources, he's going to bless me. And if I keep his kingdom first and his righteousness, then everything that I need will be, will be provided for me. Right? I know it hurts when they cheat on me. I know I'm sad when he lies. All those things, I get it. But my reward is coming. And it's priceless. And it's sure. And God is preparing a place for me. And he's going to give me all that he has promised me because he always has and he always will. So either your trial is going to end because you learned what God wants to teach you in it, and he's going to remove the trial to get it out of the way <laughs> so that he can bring the next one into your life, or they all stop because you died and he delivers you to glory. But either way, trials are temporary. They're temporary. Amen? Amen. All right. So... Trials are coming. There's many of them, but they won't last forever. So they're going to come and they're going to go, right? Here's the fourth thing. Trials are good. <laughs> they've lost some of you at good, right? <laughs> the people that said, I have them and they're long and they hurt, right? They're good. Okay. Amen. Remember, God's word says he wants to transform us into new people by changing the way you think. And I would say if I was to take a poll of the whole population of America and said, hey, are trials good? I would say the vast majority of people would say what? Mm -hmm. No, they're not, right? They're not good, especially if you're on trial. That wouldn't be good either, right? <laughs> the trials are not good, but, but God says that they are. So what does that mean? They are, right? They are. And so the challenge here this morning is to open up your mind and heart to receive what God says so you can change the way you think about trials, right? If you walk out of here with the same feeling and opinion and perspective on trials as you had when you walked in, that's an epic failure. You've got to let him change you, right? Let God change you into a new person by changing the way you think. So are you ready to change the way you think? Yeah. Yeah. Are you really? Say it, say it if you are. I'm ready. I'm ready. I'm ready, right? I'm ready. I'm ready. Okay, here it is, right? Look at verse 6 and 7. Look at verse 6, right? So be truly glad. So be truly glad. There's wonderful joy ahead, even though you have to endure many trials for a little while. These trials will show that your faith is genuine. It is being tested. You see how he talked about earlier that God is with you and he's also working with you. He's not just a passive observer. He's participating. Here's where you see it right here, right? Your faith is being tested. Someone's, someone's at work here. So when you got stuff going on, 
God shows up. He's, he's at work in something here. What, what, what's he doing? He's being tested as fire tests and purifies gold. So what is he trying to do then? He's trying to make you more pure. He, he's told you a moment ago you need to be holy like he is, right? And, and, and you're not, right? I'm not either. But he wants you to be. Right, so he's working right here. He's showing up in your problem, and he's at work in the problem, testing you and improving your faith and making you more pure. That's the word he uses, purify. Being tested as fire tested uh, purifies gold. Though your faith is far more precious than mere gold. I like that, too, right? I think all of us here, especially in our country, we would think, man, I'd love to get my hands on some gold, man. That would be awesome, right? Tired of being broke. I'd love to be rich. That'd be super. I need some gold. We have, we put gold, we have, we hold it in very high esteem, don't we? Right? And, and I love how God just, not only does he say that your faith, that this thing that you have with me is more precious than gold, I like what he calls the gold. Mere gold. Like it's nothing. Right? It's, so he takes the thing that we desire the most and he lowers it down where it needs to be, under your feet. Right? It's more precious than, than mere gold. So when your faith remains strong through many, there it is again, through many trials, it will bring you much praise and glory and honor on the day that Jesus Christ is revealed to the whole world, right? So he says, so, so be truly glad, right? Not just because of this future inheritance that you're going to get, right? We know that. That's awesome. We should be glad about that. But then what else does it say here? Because praise and and glory and honor are coming to you. If you endure to the end, if you let God do this in your life, and you endure to the end, there's going to be a special praise of glory and honor from Jesus himself. I, like I mean, I, I like it when, when, when I walk out of here and you guys say, hey, that was a good message. I, like, I appreciate that. I like it. That's cool that you do that, right? I like an attaboy from you guys. I'm, I'm totally digging an attaboy from Jesus, though. Like, I love you, but just not that much. Like, your praise is not as good as if Jesus Christ, the creator of heaven and earth, right, would come up to me and say, hey, great job, bro. Like, that would fire me up, right? I hope it would fire you up. And that comes. That's why we should be truly glad. So we don't look at the problem so much, but we look at the future. It says, hey, I've got something great coming in heaven. And also, Jesus is going to cut the clouds one day. He's going to show up. and He's going to say, Joseph, great job. Man, that's all, that gets you fired up, right? I hope it gets you fired up. And then the second thing here, the reason why we should be glad and the trials are good is because when we're going through it, God is using that to strengthen your faith so that you can endure to the end, right? So that you can endure to the end. So, so here, here's, the, here's great stuff right, right here. Have, have you bent the knee to Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Have you done that? Have you done it? Have you done it? Right? I hope you've done that, right? And if, and if you've done that, then, then that means you're, you're not lost, but you're, you're saved, right? That's, that's great news, right? You're saved. But here's the thing. Maybe there's just a little bit more than that. I just want to offer this to you for your consideration. Jesus Christ himself, the one you put faith in for your salvation, tells us, in quotes, in red, Matthew 24, 13, that the one who endures to the end will be saved. The one who endures to the end will be saved. See, a lot of people start out big and strong, and right, they start out strong, right? They, 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 they someone shares the gospel with them, and they, they, they get it, and it clicks, and their heart, and it resonates, and they're like, yes, and they, and they, they run to the altar, and they give their life to Christ, and then problems come and persecution and disappointment and it didn't work out the way I thought and trials and tribulations and sorrows and, and it's not working the way I thought it was going to be when I rushed down the aisle and, and so I run, right? A lot of people start out strong but many people will fall away, won't they? The Bible says a lot of people are going to fall away. We see it. People fall away all the time but that's not what God wants you to do and the, and the proper perspective on the trial will help you endure to the end. Right? It will help you endure to the end. Right, And so, uh, for those that endure, that's what it said there, right? For those that endure, right? Those that endure. James chapter 1 says it, just a couple pages back. You can look there, right? Verse 3, oh, let's go to verse 2. Dear brothers and sisters, when troubles, same thing as trials, come your way, consider an opportunity for great joy. There it is again. They're good. They're good, yet they're good. Why? 
For you know that when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. So let it grow. When your endurance is fully developed, you'll be perfect, complete, needing nothing, right? To endure, to endure. Verse, uh, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 6, it says it again right there. Uh, even though you have to endure many trials for a while. So, so um, the word endure in Greek, can you put that up on the screen so you can see this? Okay, can you guys see that? I can't pronounce Greek. I'm not a Greek scholar, but hupomeno, hupomeno is the word that is used there to endure. Okay, so when you look it up, let's let, you can jot that stuff down if you want. But let me just go over with you what it is. The root word is meno, meno. Okay, meno means to abide, to stay in place, to remain, to stand, to continue. I'm I'm not moving from right here. Right, that's meno. And, and hupo means under, right? I'm staying under this, right? See, a lot of us are trying to pray away every problem that comes into our life. I rebuke it with my greatest rebuker. I don't want that. No disease, no trial, no problem, no lack, no nothing, right? That's what we do. We're trained to do that. But God says, but those who will remain under this thing, right? If you remain under this thing, when you listen, here's the amazing thing about hupo meno. If you stay under this trial, when you put the two words together in Greek, it changes its, its definition ever so slightly to include all that you see on the screen, but it also says to stay under it cheerfully and hopefully, right? You stay under this thing because God is allowing this to happen to teach you something, right? So I'm going to stay under this thing with a good attitude knowing that God is with me, he's working with me, he's trying to teach me something in this, and so God, I'm going to stay under this thing, I'm not going to try to dodge it, I'm not going to run away from it, I'm not going to try to pray it away, I'm going to stay under this thing, and so you have your complete work done in me, so God, I don't know what it is, but what are you trying to teach me in this, right, so I'm going to stay in this thing until the lesson is learned, right, this trial is strengthening me, so I get spiritually strong, so I can stay attached to him forever. I need that, right? We're so prone to wander. So I can trust him more, so I can rejoice in him more, right? The trial is brutal sometimes. But when God delivers me yet again, right, my trust is going to increase, my faith will grow stronger, I'll be encouraged, and I'll, I'll trust him even more. And this trust is going to get me to the finish line, amen? That's what I need. Where finally, right, when I, when I finally cross the finish line, James says it's so perfect. In that time, you'll be fully developed, perfectly complete, needing nothing, right? All trials have ended, all heartache is removed, all loss is forgotten, and now I bow before God and before his Lamb who sits on the throne, and there's no more sorrow and no more pain and no more suffering and no more sickness and no more tears and no more death, just never-ending bliss and eternity with all the redeemed through every generation, all coming together to shout together, praise the Lord, salvation and glory and power belong to our God. Amen? That's, that, that's what we have to look forward to. Okay? So not only do trials come, and not only will trials go, and there'll be many, and not only will they prepare us for eternity, if we stay under this temporary trial, right? Hupo meno, if we stay under this thing and learn. But here's the last thing about trials that will encourage you. It's another reason why they're good. First Peter 4, we were there. Verse 12 was, don't be surprised. Look at verse 13. Don't be surprised as if something strange were happening, right? They're coming. And instead of thinking that, he says, instead, be very glad. Not just be glad. Earlier he said be glad. Now he's like, no, be very glad. Right? So something good's about to come down the pike right here. Right? If, 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 look, if, if, if before you to be glad because you get to have an inheritance that's coming, right? That's what it said. Be glad because you have a, an inheritance that is priceless and pure and undefiled and beyond decay. And the enemy can't mess with it. And it's there for you when you take your last breath. It's going to be there. It's awesome. And we should let that bleed back. But here's something that says, don't just be glad about that. Like, that's good. Here's great. Be truly glad about this. It just really reinforces it right there. It said, be very glad. For these trials make you partners with Christ in his suffering. Why isn't everyone applauding there? Yeah. 
<laughs> right? But see, see, listen, listen, listen. This is not to condemn you. It's to encourage you. Do you see how you didn't clap? That says something about our hearts. It, it says that, that we don't like suffering, that we don't like trials. That even though you can be a part, listen, I want to be, I'm, I, I love my wife. She's my partner in life, right? That, that's awesome. But remember earlier I said it would be great when you say, hey, nice sermon, preacher. And I'm like, yeah, that's pretty good. But when Jesus does it, like it's way better. She's my partner in my life, right? So I'm happy that she's my partner. But I'm way happier that Jesus is my partner. Amen. I'm way Amen. happier, right? Way, and she's so happy that Jesus is her partner because I let her down all the time. He never does. Like, he's the king of the universe. I'm just a schmo. I mess up all the time. So, so, so listen, the problem is that we think that being partners with Christ in suffering is not something to applaud. But, 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 but does your response sound like no. truly glad? No. No. I mean, I'm, I'm not ripping you guys. I love you, right? But it's true. <laughs> no one's clapping when I said you get, to be a, you get to be a partner with Christ in his suffering. No pain, no gain. Nobody wants that. And here's where God wants to change the way you think. I'm going to give this another run. You ready? <laughs> here we go now. This, you got one chance for this right here. <laughs> Dear friends, don't be surprised at the fiery trials you're going through as if something strange were happening to you. Instead, be very glad for these trials make you partners with Christ yeah. in suffering. Yeah. 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 Right. Right. So you will have, listen, Partners with Christ in his suffering have a special blessing that not everybody gets. Yeah. Watch what it says here. Make your partners with Christ in his suffering so that you will have the wonderful joy of seeing his glory when it is revealed to all the world. Right? So be very glad because we get to be partners with Christ. Right? Here, here's the thing. Here's the thing that I noticed. Maybe you noticed it too. When God is working on you like this, when he's involved, when, when you're in this suffering, when you're in these trials and God is using it to strengthen and grow you, when God is working on you, it proves your sonship. Amen. Right? It proves your, your daughtership, if that's a word. Is that a word? Right? It proves that you're his. Right? When, when, when Hebrews, I think it's chapter 12. He chastens those he loves, right? If you're not getting whooped by God on occasion, you might not be his, That's right? Because right? all of God's kids are getting whooped. And if you're not getting whooped, hey, my life's perfect right now, right? I have no trial, no suffering, no problem. Everything is perfect. No, no, no. Be careful. Check yourself, right? Check yourself. You might not be his because all of his kids are getting spanked, right? So, there's a special glory for those who are identified as his, right? There's a special glory. You get to see his wonderful glory when it's revealed to all the world, right? You get to show Christ. When you're his partner in his suffering, right? He did something. His life painted a picture for the world to see, right? And we get to be a partner with him, right? So, you get to show Christ to a lost and hurting world when you're in trials, right? Not that when everything's awesome and you're rocking it, hey, if you're a Christian, you can be like me. I got the, the most money, total health, total wealth, total happiness, best house, best car. I never have a problem. That might not be the best witness for Jesus, right? When Christ suffered, he was at peace. It says in the scriptures that he left his situation in the hands of God who always judges fairly. He didn't complain. He didn't fight back. He didn't back out. He didn't dodge the problem, right? Is there any other way, Father? But your will be done, not mine, right? He didn't back out of the problem, right? He was a model of cool, calm, and collected in all of his trials. And we can learn from that. 1 Peter 2.19 says that God is pleased with you when you do what you know is right and patiently endure. There it is again. Hupo meno. When you patiently stay under unfair treatment. Is that not Jesus? What did he do wrong? Nothing. Nothing. What happened to him? Whipped, beaten, spit on, stripped naked, and killed. He never complained about it, and he never tried to dodge this, this thing and rebuke it and try to get out from under it. Never. He stayed under it. So how do we witness for Christ, right? A, like I said, a Christian isn't necessarily the, the best witness when they're the richest, most worldly, successful guy or lady, where it seems to, like, everything just falls into place. I have everything. It all goes perfect all the time. Every single time, maybe that's not it. 
Can God bless someone with great wealth and prosperity? Absolutely he can. But that doesn't necessarily be a, that's not necessarily always a mark of true witness for Christ, right? But when a true witness for Christ, all the time, every time, it, it, when people see you, they see Christ. When you are patiently enduring trial after trial after trial after trial, and they go, man, almighty, what's with that guy's life? But he always smiles. He's always got joy. He's always rejoicing. Nothing seems to bother. It's like Paul, right? Everywhere he went, whipped and beaten and persecuted, put in jail. And what does he do? What did all the disciples do? They start singing hymns in jail. Yeah. They, 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 they said, man, we're so, I got, I'm bleeding, right? I got whipped and beaten. I'm bleeding, right? And I'm rejoicing that I got to suffer for his namesake. What do you do with a guy? Like, that's a witness for Christ, right? Yeah. There's lots of rich people out there. Lots of people with perfect health and perfect bodies, but they're miserable and lost and going to go to hell. But the person who is like bleeding from, from being whipped for being a Jesus follower and he starts singing, wow. come on, right? We need some of that, right? Cheerfully, patiently, enduring one trial after another. Why do we do this? Well, one, because Christ did it. He's our example. Because we know that God is with us, teaching us in all these situations. Because we understand that trials come, but trials are not going to last forever, so we can rejoice because we know something better is coming. Okay? And because eternity's glory far exceeds the temporary struggles of life. So I don't live down and out because of my trials, but I'm glad and I live with great expectation. Right? That's the way we're supposed to live. In light of eternity, I can smile. I can be at peace because I know that God is with me. He's working on this with me. He's not just watching, but he's working with me, right? Jesus is with you right now. And if you're one of those people who would say, um, I just came out of a trial, what did you learn? If you're heading into one and one's heading towards you, be prepared. But if you're in one right now, which... I guess probably everyone is. <laughs> we all got something, right? Just know that Jesus is with you right now. Amen. He's Amen. right. He's with you right now in the trial. That's he's right. the friend that never leaves, right? He's oh, he's he's he, man. He's a nosy little guy, right? He's always up in your grill, right? He's always there, right? But there's comfort in that because we know because he's there. He's watching and he sees and he's helping and he's teaching you and he's strengthening you to prepare you for his bodily return listen here's the here's the good news and we're done and with his return comes the eternal salvation of your soul Hallelujah. amen praise god amen praise him. Keep praise him let's pray father we thank you so much for the the truth that you shared with us this week and this morning and lord god we we we, we understand that what you're saying here is true and, and maybe even for some of us, we understood this before we got here. But we're thankful, Lord, that you, you, you're you with us even now. And so gracious to remind us that you're here. So gracious to remind us that the trials are coming, but that you're working on them. And they will end when and if. We hoop memo. When and if we stay under this thing and learn what you want us to learn, to grow the way you want us to grow. So as you, like your word says, so that we could be perfect, needing nothing, fully complete. That's what we want to be. We're supposed to grow, God, we understand that. So with your help, Lord, we're gonna take in these things that you shared with us this morning in your word. And, and, and I'm believing right now. I believe you, Lord. I believe you. I believe you. I believe that you're going to do some changes in these people's lives right here this morning. That we're not going to have the same view on trials anymore. That we're not going to give up on you. We're not going to walk away from you and think that there's a better idea. There's no better idea than you, Lord, Lord Jesus. There's no better idea. There's no, there's no plan B. This is it. To remain attached to you. 
and let you do your great work in us, Lord. So help us to have a new perspective on our trial and help us to live today and each day moving forward with the truth that we have an amazing inheritance coming our way, that you have gone to prepare a place for us, and that at the right time, you're going to come back and you're going to gather us up so we can be with you forever, and we're going to inherit all that you have planned for us. That's going to be awesome, Lord. And because of that truth, help us to fix our eyes on that truth, and because of that truth, we pray that you'd help us to let that future blessing bleed backwards into our life right now so we could live with not sorrow and worry and, and depression and despair and, and things are horrible, but no, Lord, we're going to let that future blessing bleed backward into our life right now so we don't live down. We live up with great expectation that, Lord, you are going to deliver on your promise of giving us this incredible inheritance when we, can, when we come to see you. Or you come to see us, right? Yeah. We don't know where it's going to be, Lord, but it's going to be awesome. So we praise you for that. And we pray that you'll help us to rethink, change the way we think, Lord, because we need to change the way we act. So do that great work in us now. Lord, I pray that now you'd speak to all your people in this area of giving. We want to give generously towards your kingdom. We want to be thankful for all that you've done for us. We want to give in a way that helps others to understand and to know. To, to fund this ministry so that it can go forth with power and, and, and aggressively campaign for the souls of the men and women in this community and beyond. 